The Hedgehog by Dick Kingsmith, the master of animal adventures. Illustrated by Anne Cronheimer. Part 3, Chapter 7 to 9. Chapter 7. What a happy scene of grunting, snuffling, squeaking joy there was in the garden of 5A as the girls were woken to be told the good news. And what a jolly crunching of snails there was as the family celebrated with a feast. After it all, Max slept heavily and by evening when he reappeared, the neighbour had come through the hedge twice once to inquire if Max was back, and again to ask if he was quite well. At first, Ma and Pa felt a little uncomfortable at these visits. Ma, because she knew what Pa had done. Pa, because he knew what the neighbour knew. But the matter was not mentioned. They had been wrong, they found, in supposing that a family of hedgehogs lived next door. The neighbour had never married and, as elderly bachelors often are, he was rather lonely and very fond of children. He had already invited Peony, Pansy and Petunia to come and play in his garden whenever they liked and, seeing that they were not sure how to address him, had asked them to call him Uncle. Uncle what? they said. The neighbour scratched his head thoughtfully with his hind foot. Let's see now, he said. I live in the garden of number 5B. How about Uncle B? After dark, the family were worm hunting on the lawn when there was a rustling in the dividing hedge and the three girls ran towards it crying, Uncle B! Uncle B! Uncle B! Who's Uncle B? asked Max. Our next door neighbour, said Ma. That's what the girls call him. They've been playing in his garden. But Pa, said Max, I thought you didn't stick him. Pa was saved from replying by the approach of Uncle B and now Max recognised him. <laughs> oh, hello sir, he said politely. You're the gentle hog I met in the park. Thank you very much for your help. Don't mention it, Max, said Uncle B. Glad to hear from your parents that you're um, totally recovered. You should stay in the garden, son, said Pa. You're safe in here. Max considered this. He had no intention of giving up his search. The neighbour had helped him once. Maybe he could do so again. As if reading his thoughts, Uncle B said, Well, I must be running along now. Any time you feel like having a chat, Max, you just pop over. The next night, Max popped over. Hello, young fellow, said Uncle B. Have some munchy meat. They always give me more than I can manage. No thanks. It's your advice I need, said Max, getting straight to the point. Shoot, said Uncle B. He listened carefully while Max told him everything that had happened so far in his efforts to find a safe hedgehog crossing. I must say, he said when Max had finished, I admire your spirit and your ambition. Finding a really safe way to cross roads would benefit the whole of hedgehog kind. But the two methods that humans use don't seem to be suitable for us. No better, it appears from your experiences that the old time honoured way, look right, look left, look right again before going across. One thing strikes me, however, Uncle B paused. What's that, Uncle B? All your research so far has been at night time because hedgehogs are nocturnal. But humans aren't. 
They don't see at all well at night, which is why they keep on clobbering us. Now, if you could only find a place to cross in broad daylight, then at least they could see us coming. It might pay us to change our habits. Better to lose your sleep than your life. That's what I say. Well, said Max, I suppose that either of the two ways I've tried would work in daylight too. Now, if only there was a human who could stop the traffic and make absolutely sure it didn't move till you were safely over. There are humans like that, said Uncle B. I saw one once when I was out during the day. Not something I often do. He was a big man dressed in blue with a tall domed hat on his head. He just held up his hand and everything stopped while some small humans crossed the street. Once they were safely on the other side, he waved the traffic on again. Max pondered this. So, he said, there might be lots and lots of small humans who have to cross the street by day. Uncle B nodded. And the big humans, Max continued, would worry about the small ones getting across safely. Oh yes, just like hedgehogs. So there simply must be a special, perfectly safe daytime crossing place for small humans. Now, where on earth could that be? You tell me, Max. You tell me, said Uncle B. I will, said Max. I will. Chapter 8 Max could hardly wait for the next dawn. Something inside him said that today he would at last be successful in his quest. And outside him, every one of his 5,000 spines tingled with excitement. The more he thought of his conversation with Uncle B, the more he felt convinced that the answer to the problem lay with the small humans. Their crossing place must be the safest. Follow them and he would find it. He waited until the family were fast asleep and then, blinking in the unaccustomed sunlight, he went along the path by the side wall of number 5A to the front gate. He did not go under it, but waited, watching beneath it. Already, he had learned that you could tell the age of humans from the size of their feet, and he settled himself to wait patiently until a pair of small ones should come past. When at last they did, he was about to go out and follow, but then another pair went by, and then several pairs, and then, as the pavement filled up with school-going children, dozens and dozens of small feet went walking, dancing, skipping, hopping past his gate. All of them were going in the same direction, to his left, up the road, which would take them, he knew, to the end of the row of houses and pass the factory to the red man and the green man. Was that, after all, where all small humans crossed? He must follow. He must know for sure. At last, when it seemed to him that no more feet were coming, Max crept under his gate and set out. Some way ahead, he could see the tail of the procession and he hurried after. He had passed the last of the houses and reached the factory entrance when he saw that the crowd was taking no notice of the changing red and green men. They were going to a spot further on. And they were crossing over the road there. He ran on under the notice Maximum speed, five miles per hour, and he wasn't far short of it, until he was close enough to see exactly what was going on. 
and oh, what a scene it was. Oh, what a scene it was, he told the family and Uncle B that evening. There was this great big human. It was a female, I could tell by the voice, and she was dressed in a long white coat and she had a black cap with a peak and she carried a long pole and on top of the pole was a big white round disc with an orange rim and black marks on it. A magic wand it must have been because she walked out into the middle of the street and held it up all the and held it up and all the traffic stopped dead. He paused for a breath. Then what? said Pa. Then all the small humans went across and the great big female just stood there until the very last one reached the other side safely. And all that time, everything stood absolutely still. Buses, lorries, cars, motorbikes, not one of them dared move an inch for fear of the great female and her magic wand. Where did the small humans go, Max? asked Uncle B. Into a huge building, said Max, and I hid myself and watched all day. And at the end of the afternoon, they all came out of the building again and there was the great female waiting for them in her white coat and her black hat and she waved her wand again and saw them all safely back across. I tell you, it's the ideal place for us. The huge building's right next to the park. Nothing would ever dare touch us if we were under the protection of that great, powerful human. Caution. Children Crossing. But I don't want to spend the daytime in the park, said Pa. Setting out in the morning and coming back in the afternoon, that's no good to me. I need a good day's sleep. You could still get that old hog, said Uncle B. You could go over in the morning, find a place to lie up under the bandstand. Let's say, get your eight hours, have a good night's hunting and come back the following morning. Do it once a week, perhaps. You could take your wife and the girls. It would make a nice outing. Oh, please, Pa, please, please, cried Peony, Pansy and Petunia. Pa considered this. One of us ought to try it first. See if it works, he said. And if anyone's going, it's me. Not without me, said Ma stoutly. Why not let me go, said Uncle B. After all, I've had a good long life, and if anything goes wrong, there'll be no one to miss me. Oh, yes, there will, cried all the family. Look, said Max, you don't know which way to go, how to get there, where exactly it is. None of you can go without me. Well then, said Ma, why don't we all go? Chapter 9 Very early the following morning, seven spiny shapes emerged from under the front gates of numbers 5A and 5B. They set off up the road, passing garden after garden, from many of which, like 9B, a hedgehog had set out on a journey to the park, never to return. If only they could succeed today. Henceforth, the street would be forever safe for all hedgehog kind. 
They pass the factory and the automatic crossing with its little red and green men and came at last to the spot where Max had seen the great female with the magic wand. Opposite them, across the street, the school clock showed six. The hedgehogs concealed themselves in a doorway and settled down to wait. At a quarter past eight, the lollipop lady arrived. Even the earliest children never appeared before half past, but she liked to be in good time. She stood stamping her large feet, for it was a crisp morning. She smoothed down her long white coat. She settled her black cap firmly. Then, grasping her staff of office, its circular disc bearing the words, Caution, Children Crossing, she stood at attention at the curbside ready for the first comers while the early rush hour traffic roared past. Never for the rest of her life did the lollipop lady forget the sight that now met her eyes. Coming along the pavement towards her were seven hedgehogs in single file. Surely you're not going to school? said the lollipop lady when they reached her. The noise she made meant nothing to Max, but he advanced to the edge of the curb, his nose pointing eagerly across the street. The others lined up behind him. We wish to go to the park, he said. Kindly stop the traffic. The noise he made meant nothing to the lollipop lady, but his intention was as clear as the day. Raising her magic wand on high, the great female strode into the middle of the street and at the sight of her, the traffic meekly halted. Then, before the astonished eyes of those fortunate enough to witness this historic occasion, there walked across the street a slow, solemn, dignified procession of hedgehogs. At the rear was Uncle B, shepherding before him Peony, Pansy and Petunia. In front of them was Ma. In front of her was Pa. But at the head of the file, there marched that pioneer of road safety, Victor Maximilian St. George, a name to be remembered forever by hedgehogs the world over. Tell us the story of the first crossing, mummy, little hedgehogs would plead at bedtime, and then they would listen, enthralled to the tale of Max, the hedgehog, who became a hedgehog, who became a hero. Always, the mothers ended with the same words. And they all crossed happily ever after.